John 21, last chapter, last message. Um, and we're going to start this morning, just our text this morning uh, we'll be reading uh, is verse, starting in verse 15, John 21 and verse 15. John 21 and verse 15. The Bible says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he has spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. And the message this morning is, How much do you love Jesus? How much do you love Jesus? We see the question from Jesus to Simon Peter, Lovest thou me more than these? He's asking, How much do you love me? How much do you love me? And, and Peter, I, you, I love you. You know I love you. But how much do you love Jesus? That's the question this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for this uh, special portion of scripture, this, this um, conversation between Jesus and Peter that is uh, very revealing about Peter's heart, but also challenging to us. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us in this to examine our love for you. And then if we love you, what does that mean for our lives? How should that, uh, what does that look like? And Lord, I pray you'd help each and one today that we'd increase in our love for you, that we'd be honest, examine our lives, and increase uh, as, you, uh, as, as, as you are so good. You, you loved us. We love you because, we first, because you first loved us. And, and Lord, I thank you for that love you've shown to us. And uh, most of all, by Jesus Christ coming to pay the price for our sins and providing the way of salvation. And I do pray that you'd help us this morning. The message would be exactly what you want it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. How much do you love Jesus? In verses 1 through 14, we're going to uh, view this first before we get into that heart of the text that we just read. Uh, Jesus showed himself once again to the disciples. And uh, let's go back to chapter 21 and verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed, the, showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We go also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Now, think about back to when uh, Jesus was giving his mission to his disciples. I mean, just back in John 20, he said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. So he was telling them, I'm sending you to do the work that I have for you. And what, do they, what are the disciples doing? They're going fishing. They're going fishing. Uh, but what did Jesus say when he first called the disciples? You might be familiar with this because they were fishermen. But he would go and he, he called them and he said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. So here, were they going out and being fishers of men? No, Peter said, no, I'm going fishing uh, for fish. And uh, so Jesus is coming back and I believe uh, Jesus is coming to them, showing himself again to remind them of what their mission is. What did he give them to do? And, and, and maybe giving them that prodding uh, that is needed. Why did Peter go fishing? Uh, the others said, we also go with thee. And so they went for, they didn't catch anything. And that's when Jesus came and, and told them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find. They cast therefore, now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. So 
the, Jesus blessed them, uh, allowed them to catch quite a bit. But why did Peter go fishing in the first place rather than getting to work on what Jesus had told uh, them to do as he's, he's being sent? Maybe he's, is he waiting for something, waiting for a little more direction, maybe waiting for the empowering of the, of the Holy Spirit to come upon him? Um, but Jesus did say, he breathed on him and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost and I'm sending you. So what was Peter supposed to be doing? Well, he should have been uh, focused on what the mission was, but you know, they needed something to eat. Maybe he was going to find something to eat. Either way, they did get something to eat because Jesus provided it for them. And, uh, but maybe he struggled with the thought of his denial of Christ. Remember that uh, Peter had denied Jesus Christ three times. We didn't really focus on that in, our, in, in the series through John, but, um, but that, was, that was part of that account of Christ's crucifixion. Prior to his crucifixion, Peter did deny Christ three times. Uh, Jesus knew he was going to do it. He told Peter he was going to do it. And when Peter did it, and Christ looked at him, and he realized what he had done. He went out and wept bitterly. So here's someone who does end up being a changed man. So was he struggling with the thought, thought, or perhaps he just had no direction other than going back to what he knew? And you th think about it, it. It's very easy to become reliant on a person that when you're with a person, and then once that person is gone, if you got so reliant on that person, think about Peter walking with Jesus for three years and the other disciples walking with Jesus for three years and then all of a sudden Jesus is no, no longer with them. Wait a minute now, I, I don't have Jesus. I mean, he has Jesus to rely on in, in spirit, but as far as in person, things are different now. I can't lean on him as far as my walk on this earth, as far as, uh, as, far as physically, him physically being there because he's not always going to be there. And so that can be a challenge, even today, humanly speaking, putting aside Jesus being there on the flesh, that can be the same thing in our human relationships as we, it's good to have a reliance on one another. We shouldn't just simply be so self-sufficient that we never act like we need anybody or never realize that we need anybody. Uh, the Bible says, no man uh, uh, you know, liveth to himself, but whether we live or would die, we are the Lord's. And, you know, no person is an island, as the saying goes, no man is an island. And uh, so there are, there's, there's healthy dependency on others, that we should uh, uh, lean on each other at times. But then there are times when if that person you typically rely on is not there, then what do you do? That can be a challenge. That can be, uh, now, you've, now you've got to, now you have to examine what's actually inside of you. What motivation do you have? What opportunity are you going to take to go forward and do the things that need to be done and, uh, and living life and, and making it through the challenges of life. And so, you know, oftentimes it is easy. Just go back to what you know. Peter went back to what he knew, but Jesus was not done with him. He was not done with the other disciples. As a matter of fact, things were just getting started. I look at this as kind of a lull. Uh, there's that high point of the resurrection and Jesus then appearing to them in the upper room, but then after all of that is said and done, here's this law. Jesus hasn't ascended yet. Uh, they haven't been, uh, the, the, the day of Pentecost hasn't taken place yet where the Holy Spirit came down uh, and empowered them to do the work that, uh, uh, that uh, Christ wanted them uh, to do. And, uh, and so, you know, it's kind of a law there. But even in the midst of the law, God is still there. God still has an agenda. God still is working and wants us to focus on uh, what he wants. And uh, how much do you love Jesus? We're going to see Peter's uh, love for Jesus here, his stated love for Jesus. And what Jesus said to him is an indication, a good indication, how much should we love Jesus or what does our love for Jesus look like? Say, oh, I love, I love Jesus. Well, here's, here's what Jesus said to Peter that would reflect his love for him. Uh, in verse uh, 7, Therefore that disciple, disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and laid fish laid thereon and bread. Now, 
I, I should have chosen the song, we should end with the song today, Come and Dine, uh, because that's based on this, uh, it's kind of has a spiritual application, but it's really related to this particular uh, account. And someone wrote a song called Come and Dine, and Jesus said, Jesus told them that. Uh, in verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Uh, do we have any fishermen here, fisherwomen? Uh, anybody like to fish? Okay, all right. And um, would you like to catch 153 fish in a day? Would that be exciting to you? Not yeah, not the cleanup. As long as the ranger wasn't around. As long as that, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> catch and release, catch and release. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right, that is true. Um, but, uh, in, in, you know, that'd be, I don't know, I mean, that's, that's just with a, a, a line, you know, a, a line and a hook, I mean, 153 is a extreme, and this is a net, so you, it's, it's easier to catch 153 fish. But that's still, I mean, for them, with a net, that was a good catch. That was a really good catch. And um, so a very good catch here. In verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. And so here we have, they, they've eaten their meal, they have the fish, they have the bread. And so then that's where we get into our text today, as Jesus is asking, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Lovest thou me more than these? And Peter's answer was, yes, thou knowest that I love thee. And what was his response? His response was, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Second time he asked him, feed my sheep. Third time he asked him, feed my sheep. Now what's interesting here is that the word feed, the first time it is used, means to nourish. Uh, feed, the second time it's used, means to tend or supervise. And the third time it's used, once again, means to nourish. And so not just one use of the word feed here. It was a little more uh, involved than that. It wasn't just uh, nourishing, giving something uh, for them to eat, to take in. Uh, but it was also to tend or supervise. And that's the job of a pastor. And what Jesus is reminding Peter here, there are some people that I have that need to be fed. There are some people that need to be nourished. There are people that need to be tended or uh, supervised. And that's, that wraps, uh, that's really what involves the job of a pastor. His lambs and sheep were those who believed on him and made up the developing church. Now, the, uh, I see this here. I don't know if this is the way the Lord intended it. But what I find interesting is three times, and he says lambs the first time, and who are, who are the lambs? Those are the younger ones. Those are the younger ones. What, what do younger ones need? Whether, it's, whether someone's a young child physically or young in the faith, what do they need? Well, they need the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. They need the basics of nourishment, spiritual nourishment uh, when it comes to spiritual growth. Uh, and those who are younger need just a nourishing, healthy diet of the basics. But then you get into growing up into a full-fledged sheep. They, they go on to needing to be tended and supervised, just some oversight, some direction, uh, some guarding. A lot of that's for guarding when you tend. Uh, and then also, but then the, the sheep still need to be nourished as well, not just when they're lambs, but when they grow up, they still need to be fed and they need to be nourished spiritually speaking. I don't know if that's there in that order for that reason, but that's what I see there, that there's that progress that's made is from a lamb up to, uh, uh, up to even the sheep, but they need to be nourished. First Peter, interestingly enough, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. Oh, interesting. He uses the term flock. Jesus told him, feed my sheep. And now here he's saying, feed the flock of God, which is among you, 
taking the oversight thereof, so there's the two, there's the feeding, the nourishing, and there's the oversight, not by constraint, but willingly, not just, oh, because I got to do this, oh, yeah, it's just a, uh, no, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So in other words, not doing it to get some sort of material gain, that that should not be the motivation of feeding the flock of God and taking the oversight, but of a ready mind. It's, it's with the right mind, the, the proper mind of, of why it should be done and needs to be done, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And so even though there's oversight, it's not a Lord as in a king and you just do as I say and, uh, or else, but setting the example. Still having oversight, taking oversight, but still but being an example. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And that's why many pastors view themselves as Yes, pastor has to do with being a shepherd, but pastors would view themselves as an under-shepherd because Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. And uh, so, so the pastors today are working for the chief shepherd as the shepherds of the flocks in each uh, locality. And so, he, so the first, uh, how much do you love Jesus? Well, love him enough to labor for him. Love him enough to labor for him. Love him enough to labor for him. And so for Peter, that was in that position. And he's, uh, he was very instrumental in that church at Jerusalem. He was very instrumental in that. One of the part of the leadership there as that church got developed. And, and then he would go on and, and do some other things as well, going to the Gentiles and, and breaking that door, the, breaking the ice there with uh, the gospel to the Gentiles, but love him enough to labor for him. There's a, there's a saying that uh, if, if you don't live for Christ now, you're not going to die for him. People who don't live for Christ aren't going to die for him. And love him enough now that even, bef even if the going's not tough, that I'm just committed so much in my love for Christ that I want to work for him. I want to serve him in some way. And so everybody's aspect of service uh, might be a little different and, and, and what we can do. All of us should have the heart, as I w was uh, emphasizing at the end of Sunday school today, is that God's design is for teachers to teach others who want to learn, and then they get trained then to teach other people, and that continues to go on. That, that's how the whole thing keeps getting passed down. Bible doctrine, the truths of Scripture, the principles of God's Word, that's how it gets passed down. You need teachers and you need people to vote. Hopefully you have people to teach. <laughs> people want to be taught. But it's not just being taught yourself. It's being taught for the sake of then teaching others also. And while that primarily is given to the pastors, uh, as far as the church is concerned, there is a lot of ministry that can go on on an individual level or sometimes even on a church level with others in the church uh, that they go on and they teach others. Because the fact of the matter is a, a pastor cannot, I mean, a pastor can teach and preach to a congregation, but when it comes to individual teaching and discipleship, uh, the larger a church gets, the more people there are, uh, the pastor, it doesn't, doesn't cut it now many times. And, and what is ideal is when, you know, as a church grows, it gets larger, there hopefully would be multiple uh, people to assist in, pa in the pastoral ministry. But as far as any, any of you, any of you can be taught God's Word, you can receive the doctrine, the truths of God's Word, and then teach others those truths. And then they can go on and they teach others those truths. And uh, that's, that is, uh, that's a lot of our labor for him. Now, sometimes in a, in, in a church, there's other ways of laboring uh, for, among the church uh, membership. There's, there's uh, taking care of children. There's teaching children, that we, and we have that here. Um, various ways of laboring for him. There are people who then surrender to the mission field, and they you know, be like uh, the, one, the, the prayer letter I read today, the update, uh, and he surrendered. Uh, of, of wanting to labor for him. And that's what he does. He labors for God and he labors a lot for God in going around the world in these different places. But rather than l allowing him just to get back out on the boat, uh, Jesus reminded Peter of his calling. He emphasized three times. 
feed my, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. This is what you're supposed to be doing. If you really love me, then this is what you should be doing. You need to be laboring for me. Don't just go back to the, the life you once knew. Um, not that there was anything maybe wrong with him heading out on a boat once in a while to go, go fishing, but Jesus is directing him back to what he was really to be focused on. Here's the job I have for you, Peter. Here's the labor I have for you. It's a different life when you love the Lord enough to labor for him. How much do you, how much, how teachable are you that then you can both benefit from the teaching and then go on and you can teach others? How much is that? We should be constantly, we, we should have a heart to equip ourselves with sound doctrine, the knowledge of God's word, so we can teach others those truths. Uh, number two, number two, love him enough to completely surrender. Look at verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Love him enough to completely surrender. Now this is, uh, it's, it's said that Peter was uh, put to death by crucifixion. Uh, I, I guess history, tradition in history says that he wanted to be crucified upside down. So he wasn't uh, crucified the same way as Christ. Um, but uh, he was, but Jesus has given him a hint here. There are going to be others who are controlling your life. And, and then we have the insight here that it was, he was talking about what death he should die and spreading his arms and, and being carried to a place. And uh, so, Peter, you're going to, you're not going to have the choices of your life. You're, you, you're not going to clothe yourself. You're not going to just walk wherever you want. You're going to have somebody else who's doing some things to you. And, and where does he, um, and what, how does he follow up? And when he had spoken this at the end of verse 19, he saith unto him, and what does he say? Follow me. At, the end of, at the end of verse 19. What was that? Follow, me. follow me. Does everybody's Bible say the same thing? Okay, just making sure I didn't hear any. It was just crickets there until Dennis said something. That wasn't rhetorical. I was, I was literally asking you. So what does it say at the end of verse 19? That was a little better. We got a few more. Okay. Um, well, we're getting, what does it say at the end of verse 19? That, that was better. All right, it sounded better. Um, and that's what he said. So, yeah, Peter, you're going you're gonna to have other people carrying you where you wouldn't normally go. You're going to die. You're going to be crucified. You're going to be put to death. Uh, follow me. Follow me anyway. Follow me anyway. Now, that would be a test of your love for Jesus there. Now, if you were told that, okay, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be taken, you're going to become a martyr for me, some people might be tempted. Um, you know, I, I better find a different thing to do. And by the way, if that's the motive, if that's what's in the heart of a person, they better find something else to do. <laughs> it's, they're better off finding something else to do because what God is looking for, what he desires the most is for those who are in his service to be wholeheartedly surrendered to him, no matter what the cost. Because the devil, you see, the devil works when he, he likes to play on people's um, humanity as far as you know, self-preservation. He likes to exploit that. Our, our natural desire for self-preservation, what's doing, what's best for us. And if there's someone who's in the work for, of the Lord who is more interested in their self-preservation, like when the going gets tough, they're willing to, to bend a bit. They're willing to, to sw get swayed a bit. Um, you know, that's, that's easy to get people off track, but what can the devil do with someone who's wholeheartedly surrendered in, in their love for the Lord that they're willing to follow Christ and even when... They already know, well, you know, I, I might get martyred for Christ and I'm going to follow him anyway. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm going to do. The devil can't do anything with someone like that. What can he do? The only thing he can do is kill him. <laughs> but that's what they're already willing to do anyway. They're willing already to die for Christ. 
because they've already surrendered their life. So the devil cannot have their life, try to mess up their life because I'm, I'm already surrendered. I'm already his. You know, that takes a, that's, that's quite a journey to go on when to get to that point where you're willing to, to actually, and not just say the words, but to wholeheartedly know in your heart you have that attitude, you have that such strong love for Jesus that you're going to follow him no matter what the cost might be. That is quite an advancement in one's love for Christ and work for Christ. So here's how you're going to die. Here's a little insight. Follow me. Follow me. What kind of love do you have for Christ? Do you have a love do you love him enough to completely surrender? That's one thing that's, that's lacking uh, in many Christians' lives is, is, oh, yeah, I mean, I love him. I'll go through some, I'll, I'll do some of those normal things that might be accepted to do. This is just what we do. But how about just a heart of surrender that whatever God brings about in my life, I'm just going to follow him. I'm going to obey him. I'm going to love him. And I'm going to stay faithful to him no matter what, no matter what. Love him enough to completely surrender. Number three, love him enough to compare, uh, love him enough not to compare yourself with others. Love him enough to not compare yourself with others. Uh, let's read uh, starting in verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also had leaned on his breast at supper, and saith, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that this, that, that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And so John's kind of defending himself here because that's who he was talking about. <laughs> He didn't say that John's making, setting the record straight here. He, here's what he actually said. So this rumor that was going around, that wasn't true. Jesus didn't say, I wasn't going to die. He just said, if I will that he tarry till I come, then what is that to thee? He said, and, but notice what he says here. No matter what I have for John over here, you just need to follow me. Don't compare yourself in, in your future with what I have for him and his future. You just need to follow me. And that can be a great hindrance is when you start to compare with others and say, well, what, what's going on in their life? What's, uh, wait a minute, wait, why do they have something I don't? Why? No, Jesus just said, follow me. Why would they get this privilege? And, and I don't get this privilege to be here until he comes and follow me. Follow thou me. What, he says, what is that to thee? You just need to follow me. And so then that goes around. Now, it's interesting that Jesus said this, if I will that he tarry till I come. Now, he's just putting out a hypothetical. But what is interesting in John's life, now, now Christ did not come back in John's lifetime, but what is interesting about John is that he was given the privilege of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of what was going to take place in the last, the very end of days. And so in that way, no, he, he uh, did not tarry on earth until Jesus came, but he got to see the vision. He had the revelation of the coming of Jesus Christ and what was going to take place in the future. So what a privilege John had. But here's what John went through to get that privilege. He was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and it's been said in history that he was thrown into a pot of boiling oil. And so he was in not very, he was not in good shape, uh, physically speaking. Uh, he was being persecuted. He was in exile. And so we look at John and say, what, well, you know, Peter could compare himself with John. Well, John's going to get this great privilege. Well, John did get a great privilege, but it also came at a great price to him physically. Because he, he himself was also dedicated to the Lord. So it was a great a revelation he had, but it doesn't, doesn't mean he had a better life than Peter. Peter had his privileges. Peter had God's working in his life in a certain way, in a certain direction. And then John's life also, he had his. And they weren't exactly the same of what the outcome was, uh, but they both suffered for Christ and they both paid the price and they both were committed to him. They both followed him. 
but their, but their lives, the ministry can take different directions. Love him enough to not compare yourself with others. It's not about what God's doing in someone else's life. It's a matter of whatever God's going to do with them, that's between God and them. You just need to follow me, Jesus says. And so that saying goes around and in verse 24, this is the disciple which testifieth of these things and we and wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So in other words, you say, <laughs> we didn't even scratch the surface of what Jesus did. I mean, this is just a sampling. And uh, that's the way he ends the account, the gospel account. I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Put period, putting an end to that in the gospel account. You know, and, and we live in a time, and I'll be honest with you, I, I personally believe we're living in a time where God is making it so easy for us to be able to make the choice. So easy for us to make the choice. It, to, to me, it's getting easier. It's getting easier to make that commitment to say, you know, this world, does ha this world has nothing to offer me. I mean, just look at what's going on in this world. Just look at what's going on in this uh, with, with the, 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 the people, with the powers that be, and all the, all the things that are going on in the culture, society, all the things, the trouble, the problems, the... the uh, and, and, you know, what the world does, their attitude... Is, is, that's all they know. I mean, they just know what's going on in the world. Your average lost person, they just, this, this, this unsaved society, you know, and so, you know, you might read some new, and there's just hand wringing over this issue or that issue and so much uh, uh, question and, oh, we need to figure this out. We need to figure that out. We need to focus on this issue and so many issues in the world that is, are, are focused on. We well, you know why that is because they don't have, they're not following Christ. And there's a lot of stuff that the world wrings its hands about and worries about. That a person who really loves Christ and follows him, you know what, I'm just, I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about it. You know, what's going to happen to, what's going to happen in the future of our country? What are the, what are, what's going to happen? We come out on the other side of this pandemic and, and, you know, you could wring your hands about that and you could worry about that. And if anything during this last year or so has taught me is, how little we need a, what the world regards as a big deal. From a Christian perspective, how little do we need what the world regards as a big deal, as very important? So that's why I say God has given us this wide open opportunity to really make the choice of where is our heart? How much of a love for Christ do we have? And I've tried to, you know, and there's, there's still struggles that I deal with and in that, but there are, as far as uh, making that choice of, okay, I, I don't want to be distracted and, and, and by the things of this world, don't want to be caught up in the things of this world, and you know, that can, that, that can still be a struggle at times, but I've noticed, boy, there's been some good things, good opportunities God has laid out to, what does your life really consist of? Where is your heart? Where is your affection? Where is your love? What means the most to you in this life? We learned of just how little, at least I learned, and I already kind of was on this track anyway, but the last year really helped me. I learned just how little, I, had, I guess you'd say reinforced, just how little this world needs professional sports leagues. I mean, how much did your life really change when all the sports leagues got canceled last spring? Some of you say, wow, I don't have that as a distraction anymore. Wow, well, that's, that's kind of nice. Or some, but there might be some, oh, yeah, I'm missing my sports. I've got to have my sports, so I'm going to go and do, I'm going I'm to go back and look, watch the Super Bowl from, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, you know. I'm uh, going to watch the World Series. And, you know, it's kind of refreshing to actually be faced with that opportunity to be challenged of how much does this actually mean to me? How much do I miss it? Um, we realize, I hope you already realize this, but 
how little we need concerts. You know, there's the, the worldly concerts. How little do we need that? You know, people haven't been able to gather in these large numbers and large groups. And I thought, well, what a blessing. Um, you know, we, uh, there may, may be other things that you realize just how much you really didn't need certain things. And maybe it opened up the opportunity for you then to focus on your walk with Christ a little more without some of those distractions that having life upended and some of those things removed is actually a golden opportunity to make some changes, to let God change your heart and your life and get the priorities straight. What a blessing. And some would say, boy, I can't wait till all this ends. And I'd say, and I can't either, to be honest with you. But I will say, I'm convinced there are certain things that probably wouldn't have happened in the past year unless it was that way. And so what a blessing that was. And so no matter what the future may hold for our country, for the world, and for us individually, how much do you love Jesus? Do you love him enough to labor for him? I'm thankful. And, and God wants us to pray for laborers, but we don't just, we shouldn't pray for, it might be God has it lined up that somebody in this room is supposed to be a laborer for him in a bigger way. We need to pray for laborers. We need to love him enough to completely surrender to whatever his will is, but just surrender to following him. I'm just, I am 100%. Can we, can we say, I just, I, I am completely surrendered to him. And then you love him enough not to, come, to not compare yourself with others. That it's, it's not about others. It's it, as far as, uh, not about others as far as looking at them and comparing yourself. And, and in, in uh, First or Second Corinthians, uh, it does say that uh, if you compare yourselves among yourselves, you're not wise. It's not wise to have the comparison mentality. You just focus on your walk with God. You focus on the work God's doing in your life. And that doesn't mean we're self-centered. That just means that our focus on others is simply having the perspective God wants us to have as one of love and care for other people, but not of one that could provoke jealousy or envy. How much do you love Jesus? It's a good opportunity today. And as we finish up this uh, book of John, the Gospel of John, what a way to end that is with some self-examination. How much do you love Jesus? Do you need to increase in your love for him? Do you need to increase in your surrender, your labor for him? Maybe get some things out of your life that, um, are, the, that are cluttering your life spiritually? The Bible says, No man that warreth entangleth him, himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We were uh, in our Sunday school this morning. You know, we've been going through history of the churches, and we were talking about the uh, Counter-Reformation. This was the Roman Catholic Church's answer to the Reformation. And one of, them, one of that was with the uh, Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order. And there are a lot of Jesuit universities and, and schools, institutions in, in the various places, and they place a high emphasis on discipline, on education, like self-discipline, the discipline of thought, the, or as Dr. Anthony Fauci, who was uh, Jesuit educated at uh, Holy Cross and at a high school in New York, he said he loves his Jesuit education because of the precision of thought. And, and I had to ask the question, how many of God's people who know the truth, who have the gospel, who have his word, who have Jesus Christ in their life, have that kind of commitment to their mission, to God's mission, to God's commission for them. Because that's what the Jesuit order is. It's actually the mission agency of the Catholic Church. It's what it is. Um, it's like they're their worldwide missionary agency. Uh, they said, in their own words, they've been improving the world for 500 years, you know, making the world a better place for 500 years. But I think the early part of that was not a Probably not historically accurate. Depends what your definition of making the world a better place is. Um, but what, I, what, what did stick out to me was there are hearts and minds that are being 
influenced because of their dedication to their cause, because of their dedication to education. Uh, and our idea of education might be different with their idea of education, but the whole point is they have a mission and they're very dedicated to it. And how much do we love Jesus enough that we are wholeheartedly committed to whatever God wants for our lives? That we grow in our love for him and say, God, I'm just willing to do whatever you want. Whatever you have for my life, whatever you lead, I just want to fulfill your will. I want to obey your word. I completely surrender to you. Maybe there's someone here this morning who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Maybe you've never even taken that first step of following Christ. Maybe you've, maybe you've never had your sins forgiven. Maybe you've never come to him as the only one who can be your Savior. You can trust in Christ today. Get that settled with him and then commit your life after that to following Jesus Christ. Just recognize that you are a sinner, that you're under condemnation because of your sin, that no one can measure up to God's perfect standard. And recognize that you need to be saved and trust only in Christ to be your Savior. And then grow in your love for him by obeying his word, following him, Treating others the way that, uh, that Christ re says does reflect God's love. If God loves us, then we, we should love one another. We should, uh, the two great commandments are love God with all your heart. That was a, that's a pretty tall order. With all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Why do all the law and the prophets hang on those two? Because if you love God like you should, and you love others like you should, those other ones actually more easily fall into place. Everything's based on that. That should be our motivation for why we should we do what we do. If I love you like I should, I'm not going to steal from you. If I love you like I should, I'm not going to be malicious toward you. If I love God like I should, I'm going to obey his word. I'm going to have at least a heart to obey his word. doesn't mean we live a life of sinless perfection. But I'm going to at least have a desire and a heart and a mind that, yeah, whatever what God says, I want to do that. That's the reflection of love for God and love for others. How much do you love Jesus? Love him enough to labor for him. Love him enough to completely surrender. And love him enough to not compare yourself with others. Examine your heart today. How much do you love Jesus?